I'd like you to take your Bibles, please, and turn to Titus, the third chapter in verse 5. Last time we discussed in pretty good detail, we weren't saved by the works of righteousness, which we did ourselves, means we didn't measure up to serving God with perfect uh, law keeping. Nobody did, except Jesus. So we had to have his what? We're not, we, we, we were not saved by our righteousness, which we did, but his mercy, right? He, he had mercy on us to forgive us of our sins. So we pick up a question, here we go again. We pick up a question seven, to what does the washing of regeneration refer? Now let's notice the two things go together here. Not by works done in righteousness, which is ourselves, but according to his mercy, he saved us through what means. So we're saved through something, and it's called the bath of regeneration. It's called the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. So we're not justified by the works of the law. We had to have mercy, grace, love. There's his grace. But he did that through a means. And he did that called the washing of regeneration. What does Genesis mean? It's beginning. What's regeneration? I'm being born again. I'm having a new beginning. I'm being born again. And we are born again. John 3, 3 through 5, we're going to be born of water and the Spirit. Uh, and we, we see, well, how is that connected with the washing of regeneration? The Word of God, we are begotten by the Word of God in Ephesians 5, 26. He saved us through the washing of the water with the Word. He didn't take the word down the baptistry and wash you with it. Washing of water with the word, with the teachings of the gospel that lets us in on the mercy of God and we're saved by grace is through that washing of regeneration. What does that refer to? Baptism. Without a doubt to me, baptism. That's where we're going to be born again in John 3 by the spirit and the water. Here's the spirit giving us the, the teachings that we're to follow. And then there's indeed the, the, the washing that takes place in, in, in baptism. So we have here that washing of uh, regeneration is referring to the baptism. That's when people died to the old man. Uh, they, they were raised to walk in the newness of life. So we're raised from the spiritual dead, but we're born again. That's the other aspect of baptism. That's when that happens. Water does not save you. Jesus' blood saves us. So let's look at a passage in Hebrews, the 10th chapter. I think he refers to this same thing in Hebrews 10 when he speaks about the boldness that we should, we should have. In verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart and fullness of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and having our body washed with pure water. So when we're baptized, God does sprinkle us. We're not sprinkled with water, but he sprinkles our heart with forgiveness because what has the power to sprinkle our heart and cleanse our conscience of all guilt? He sprinkled our conscience with our heart or our conscience with the blood of Christ. Peter says that, but in Hebrews 9, 14 is that the blood of Christ was shed to cleanse us from our conscience so we could serve God. Uh, with, with a, out a guilty conscience. That's what baptism, it's not a taking a bath, taking away the filth of the flesh, but it's an answer of a good conscience because we have the blood of Christ to cleanse us. So in baptism, we are born again. We're raised to walk a newness of life. We're dead and now we're alive. We're born again because that word is, is uh, what begets us. And so we're say, we're, we become baptized. We have the washing of regeneration. We're born again, like Jesus promised in John 3, 5. And what all the other passages teach. To ignore that is to ignore the evidence that God gives us. So it's through the washing of regeneration. That's when we open the book of Acts. We see people joyfully going away. Their sins are forgiven. They have a new beginning in Christ because we're baptized into Christ. And it's a total new beginning. What a, a place where we can start over again. And so that's why Peter said baptism does not save us. Not as because it's magical. It just opens us. We have the word of God teach us 
the mercy of God, all about his grace, and it instructs us how we're to be regenerated. And now he says the renewing of the Holy Spirit. So we, are, we have our sins washed away, and we, be, we begin a, uh, a new life in Christ. So what is connected with our renewing? The Holy Spirit is connected with, we might say, who instead of what. But we were renewed by the Holy Spirit. We, we become a new creature. Apart from the Holy Spirit, no, I wouldn't know what to do to be saved if it weren't for the Holy Spirit guiding me in his work. That's why he saved us through, through the washing of water with the word. The word is what brings this part, and that's how the Spirit renews us. And he keeps on renewing us as Christians, of telling us how we ought to grow and telling us about the conditions of forgiveness when we do sin. But there's this renewing process that takes place with the Holy Spirit, uh, creating in us this new spirit. Look at Psalm 51. It's, it's David's feeling the, the guilt of sin. We know that. That chapter, but notice what he says in Psalm 51 and verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. God, you're going to do that, or I'm going to do it myself. God does that through his word, and what happens is that you're starting over now. You're a new creature in Christ. You're born again. So he, with his mercy, he saved us through what means? Through baptism, and when we become Children of God, raised to walk in the newness of life. Our spirits are renewed. We have the confidence that we're saved in Christ. We're, we're renewing our spirit. We're putting to death the old man. We're putting on the new man. We're bringing forth fruit of the spirit. All the New Testament points to this, this event. And it's not contradictory. It's not, well, baptism does not save you. Yes, it does. Peter will say that. But in what way? And I hope we can communicate that to our, our friends that we're looking here at this process of becoming saved. And then he says in, in verse, uh, verse 6, uh, that which is poured out upon us. What has God poured out upon us richly? What does verse 6 say? That's right. Some of your uh, translations will say, whom? Whom is he poured out upon us richly? He said, whom he poured out upon us richly. My Bible says which, which I think is helping us take the next step. How is the Holy Spirit, a person, a divine spirit, a person, poured out upon every Christian at the same time? You don't pour out a person and still have a person. But you can pour out from the person these marvelous blessings that come from him. Let me give you an example of this in Revelation. Because this word renewing, uh, this, this word poured out, takes place in, in Revelation in a very, I think, a very interesting way. Uh, uh, Revelation 16, we won't look at all of the passages. But I want you to notice that the angels are pouring out something out of the seven bowls. So we pick up in verse 2. He first went and poured out his bowl unto the earth, and it became a noisome and grievous sore upon men. Verse 3. It was poured out, the bowl, unto the sea, and it became blood as of a dead man. Verse 4. It became blood, in verse 4, fountains of waters. Not just the sea in verse 3, but now the fountains of waters that are there. Verse 6. He poured out the blood of saints. And prophets, and blood hast thou given them to drink. They are worthy. It's God bringing judgment, but what is he pouring out? Very distinct things. But what does it all sum up as? It came from one source. What is it? It came from one description. What is it? Verse 1 says the wrath of God. And every one of those particulars come from the wrath of God. He poured out the wrath of God. But how did it come? It came in different manifestations. And so he's poured out the blessings of salvation, how that is connected with us. When we're baptized, our spirits are clean. We have a clean heart. Our guilt of sin is taken away by the blood of Christ. And because Jesus was raised, we're walking a newness of life, regenerated again through the Holy Spirit. 
And from him comes the blessings. He poured out the Holy Spirit richly upon us. He's not talking about miraculous gifts. He's talking about the blessings that come from a person. So whom he poured out really means which he poured out. Those blessings that come from whom, which is a person. And it's, it's neuter, but it's a personal pronoun. <laughs> You know, well, if it's neuter, it's going to be a, uh, well, it's, if it's masculine, that would be the Holy Spirit. But it's neuter, which I think he's emphasizing more that uh, it's a personal pronoun, but it's coming of what comes from that source, which is God. And so I think that's the point. He poured, he poured us the blessings of salvation, the blessings that come from, from, the, from the Holy Spirit. Question number 10, for what does the Christian hope? What, what, is, what, is, what is your hope? Yeah, that's eternal life. We think about heaven as our, as our hope. But he spits it this way, that we've been justified by grace. All these things are grace. I mean, baptism is part of grace. And, and uh, being saved by the blood of Christ, it's all part of grace. Why eliminate baptism? Keep the blood. All those are connected here. Being justified by his grace, we might be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So there's an inheritance. Where is that inheritance located? Peter tells us that inheritance is located in heaven. Jesus Christ is our hope because he's the basis of our inheritance in heaven. So that's where our hope lies. Heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And what is indeed that based upon? It's based upon the, the, grace, the grace of God. So... That closes uh, lesson number five. Do you have any questions about when these things occur? It's a wonderful passage to teach people that you're trying to teach the gospel to and explain things because you have passages that fit there. It, it's not contradictory with teaching. It deals with the problems of miraculous salvation and that sort of thing, but it, it, it's all communicated through the word. That's why the word had to be taught first for people now to be regenerated and to be renewed and to have the hope of eternal life. So we pick up in, in lesson six, a question that we're gonna be looking at and we'll come back to it, but we need to define uh, in this last section, there's some names mentioned. We're coming to the end of the, of the book and I wanted us to begin in this section to identify uh, two things that we see here because we're gonna see a man by the name of Tychicus in verse 12. Titus is on the island of Crete, and there will be one or two men are coming to see him. When I shall send Artemis unto the R, Tychicus, give diligence to come to me. Okay, who is Tychicus in the New Testament? And he's found five times, and here's one of them. So you've got four more that would give you the whole composite of Tychicus. What is it? Yes, sir. That's right. And this is sum up when you put a, he, he is a fellow bond servant at the end. He is a fellow, he's a fellow, uh, he's beloved. He's a fellow worker and he's a fellow bond servant. He's a slave to people because he cares about people like Paul does. And he was, he has been uh, with, with Timothy on one occasion. But in, in trying to put this where I uh, have a chronological uh, view, the first time we see him, he had come in, in chapter uh, 20 and verse 4, he accompanied Paul as far as Asia. And this is when he was coming through, and he's, they're going to stop off at, uh, you know, and take the Lord's Supper. You know, he spends a week there taking the Lord's Supper with the brethren there at Troas. And he's a traveling companion. And they, they waited for so the first day of the week they could do that. And uh, they were with the church there. So he's, he's with Paul. He will go to him, uh, with him all the way to, to Rome. He'll be with him as he, he checks on Paul. He's with Paul, not as a prisoner necessarily, but he's there as an assistant. He's a fellow worker. He's beloved. And he will go and tell people about Paul's condition. So when you read Ephesians 6, 21 and Colossians 4 and verse 7, we know that those epistles were written when Paul was where? 
in prison. First imprisonment or second imprisonment? Because he's there in Rome twice. That's his first imprisonment. So Acts 20, we get him to Jerusalem. Tychicus is there. We have him in Ephesus, have him going to Ephesus. That's what we see in chapter 6 and verse 21. Also Colossians 4 and verse 7, he's going to Colossae. So Ephesus is an Asia Minor. Colossae's further southwest of Ephesus and uh, in, in that area of, of Asia Minor. And he goes there to tell them how things are going with Paul so they would not be worried about him. And then we see him in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 12, where in his second imprisonment, he says, I've sent, I've sent Tychicus to Ephesus. So he sends him two times to Ephesus. Uh, Tychicus was apparently one of Asia, and he was, he was there, people from Thessalonica. Timothy came with him on that occasion. Timothy was with him, with Tychicus and Timothy, as they were with Paul in Acts the 20th chapter, and they, they go on to Rome. So at the end, we find he's a, he's a, beloved, he's, he's a beloved brother. He's a, he's a fellow worker, I mean, a faithful worker. And he is indeed a, a, a bondservant of, of God's people. Pretty good man. He's he working behind the scenes. He's not, a, he's not an apostle Paul, but he's a fellow worker. He's, getting, he's refreshing the hearts of people when they hear about Paul's situation uh, in Rome, at, in prison, both on both occasions. And of course, he, 68 AD is when he won't get out of prison. And, uh, but during this particular time, here we're between the in, uh, imprisonments. And so he makes uh, that point. He, apparently, Tychicus was the one that comes. And he would see him in Crete. Now, the other place we want to identify, who is Nicopolis? Who, who is he? It's a place, that's right. What does it mean? It means a city of victory. It's a victorious vic a victory. There. So it must have a name. Polis, the city, and Nike. You know, you think, well, oh, I got Nike tennis shoes. That means, that means victory. My next door neighbor's dog is Nike. Just a yelping little character. And he, we, well, how long have we lived here? 40 years? And that dog's getting pretty old. But I, I have yet to, to walk out early in the morning, late at night, and he doesn't bark at me. He, he barks at everybody, even though we're friends. But he's always telling us about he's, he's the victorious dog. He's a good watchdog. Nike means victory. And you'll see that in the epistles of John. You look at that Greek word. The, the faith is the victory. Nike, Nike, Nike. Those aren't tennis shoes, but that's the Greek word for victory. Well, this is a victory. What was so important at Nicopolis? Could you locate it on a map? Could you locate Nicopolis up on a map? Well, we're going to. Here's all, all of the times that, where, where Paul went on his, his journeys. But what we see is that he, when you see this, uh, oh, excuse me. When you see, what is this boot? What place is that? Yeah, it, we all know that, don't you? We all, we all do that. Well, we come right across where, the, 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 not the toe, not the heel, but where that flat foot is. What, what's across there? The Adriatic Sea's right here, Mediterranean's down here. What, what is that city called right there? It's called Nicopolis. It's on a point here, and there's a, there's a little bay area here, uh, Isthmus here, and there was an occasion of a great victory there. And this place right here, on this part of the peninsula that sticks out. Nicopolis is on the north land mass of this isthmus. On the south land mass is where the headquarters of Mark Anthony was. Who was on the side of Mark Anthony? Cleopatra. Time, 32 BC to 31 BC. Who are they fighting? Octavius. Octavius becomes whom? Augustus Caesar, the first Roman emperor. Up until that time, Julius Caesar's been killed. And there was indeed a civil war that was taking place, but they were trying to, to keep it all together 
But Octavius found out that Mark Anthony, he wanted a little more power than just sharing it or Brown. So all of their armies, they meet out here, all their, 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 their ships. This is going to be a naval battle. They'll have their ships out here, but that's where they were encamped. Camped here on this south part of that isthmus. Uh, and you have that bay there that's there. You have, you, you have Mark Anthony, his troops. On the north side was Octavius and, and his. Who won the battle? If Octavius becomes Augustus, what happened to Mark Anthony and Cleopatra? They get defeated at Actium. This is the battle of Actium. And when they get defeated, they go to Alexandria, and you know what happened next. They committed suicide together. So the Roman Empire begins to have its place. That's the battle. That's the victory. And what Octavius did, he founded that place, his, his camp. He called it Nicopolis. That was where his camp was. Now, there's other Nicopolises that are found. Uh, there, there's one in Macedonia. But this seems to be the one that is pointing to about that great victory. And what does he say here? Uh, with here, what does he what does he want? Tychicus, he's saying, I'm sending Tychicus, but he wants Titus to do what? Give diligence to come unto me to Nicopolis. For why? I'm determined there to winter. It was a protective place there, where they could winter, <laughs> and uh, ships could be there and, and get out of storms. And they controlled that. They controlled that particular area. So here again is real life historical truths, facts that are involved. And you put them in the life of, of Paul. He just making these comments. I want to winter there. And that's where uh, hopefully that's where he got to winter. Uh, and it authorities say that's where he wintered. And then he was he was captured and fought to finally be brought to Rome and be beheaded. So those are the two uh, identifications that, that we have that we're, we're looking at. Oh, let me, let me, I, you want to write your notes. I just put them in order of, of there. And Nicopolis is, is indeed the, well, I'm not, I'm not going. Nicopolis is the, is the city of active, is that, that battle. And you, you can read about that in your history books. I think we stalled again. So I'm, I'm going to just go back to the, uh, outlines. Uh, it's back to the text. What was Titus to confidently affirm? Now we're coming back to chapter 3. We're looking at verse 7. When justified by his grace, we might be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Faithful is the saying, and concerning these things, I desire that thou affirm confidently. So here's a bridge between our two lessons. What has he just talked about that he could confirm confidently? My hope, God's grace, his mercy, how we can be saved. You confidently affirm that. And there's, there's the point of our hope of eternal life. You can affirm that confidently. It is, it is a faithful saying. Titus, you teach those people on Crete that. To the end, that they who have believed God may be what? This is our next question. What happens next? I want to confidently confirm the teachings of God's grace, the gospel, that we, we have. I want that to be done. He does that. And also, what is going to be, what he wants to have, uh, have accomplished. What we should be careful about. Okay. Does your Bible say maintain good works or have honest occupations? There's an application, you might, might say, of, of, of that. Stuck. But it, the word maintain is to be a leader of. How could you be a leader of righteousness if your occupation that you're in was, was sinful? So the leading is the point. I think of sometimes maintaining is that you maintain our roads, Mary, and, and get the potholes fixed up. You maintain our streets. Maintain. You just kind of keep it going. This word means to lead out. And he tells us some things we're to shun, we're to turn away from. But here's a, you be careful. You be thinking about this. Because these are things he's saying are profitable. 
and that profitability will be involved in setting forth. So we've got, we've got to kind of look at that, the particular context. So how am I leading out? And, and kind of to put this together, notice in verse 13, it might help you to see this. Set forward Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their journey diligently, that nothing be wanting unto them. And let our people also learn to maintain good works for what? Thank you for helping. For necessary uses. Who has necessity there in that context? Apollos, the lawyer, Zenos. You, you send them on their way. Titus, you do that. Titus didn't have the funds that brethren could be involved in doing that. Here again is our word maintain. It's what, they need to have honest occupations. That's, that's good. That's how they get their money. That would be a very bad thing. But what it is, you let those people, what they're doing is they're leading out in good works. They focus tension. People can see that their attention is upon, uh, upon a Christian. And look what they're doing. And to help the people as they go about the, the teaching of the, of the gospel as uh, Apollos and Zenos. And the last time we saw Apollos, he didn't really want to, uh, you know, we found him in Acts 18. He learns the truth about, it's not John's baptism anymore. Apparently, he's a good man now, isn't he? He's a good teacher. He's, he didn't become a false teacher because he held to his error. He changed. And when he did that, he becomes that way. And, and Zenos may be a lawyer who is uh, one skilled in the law of Moses and one skilled in, in law. And they two were together, going together like the apostles did, going together and, and teaching the gospel. And he said, uh, you send them on. You do that for necessary uses. We see this brought forth in, in the epistles of John, where indeed, People have done a good work because they're not necessarily teaching the gospel, but they are helping people go preach the gospel who are not taking money from the Gentiles. That's a good work. That's, and to be leading out, not being forced to do that, pay up now, we've got to do this. They're leading out with that type of mentality. They want to help. And that's what we're seeing uh, take, take place there. So they were to be careful about that. Question number four, what were Titus and the other Christians now to shun what were they to shun? I know what to lead out upon. What are they to shun in verse 9? Foolish questions. That means that doesn't mean I can't ask a question during class because it may be foolish. As they say, there's, you know, you want to find information. That's not, that's not foolish. But what was this connected with? Foolish questionings. What was it about? It's about the genealogies. Foolish questions and genealogies and strifes and fightings about the law. They are what? They're not profitable. What's profitable? That's this idea of leading out with these good works. David? And to what now? Right. But what if you don't know if it's that way? <laughs> Maybe it helped me to be a better Christian, and it may be irrelevant. I understand that. And you see, that's the case. But that's why I'm saying to ask a question in class, I don't want to go start there. Uh, because it's probably going to be instructive for everybody, for everybody else. Because they probably see the same, uh, same thing uh, again. Was I... Foolish by saying it was Nicopolis, who, who was he? <laughs> no, it's a way of saying, do we pay attention? And you did. He said, it's not a person, it's a place. And that's exactly right. There's, there's ways of, of getting people's attention to, be, to, to do these things. And so those were the things that we see it over and over again in these epistles uh, with Timothy and, and Titus that people wanted to look at genealogies. And what I've read about it, they would pick a, an Old Testament figure the lineage of, of Jewish law. Well, does it make any difference what lineage of the tribes of Israel you were? It doesn't make, your ethnicity doesn't matter. But so that would be relevant to our salvation. And so you need to pay attention to that. But they would be arguing, you know, Abraham did this. Abraham did this. And it's not recorded. And they would have questions about those things. Or there would be stories that are generated 
uh, about them. Uh, endless genealogies about, that's what's important. You know, what, what family tree we're from. As you say, that's relevant to our salvation. And, and ignore that. It just tells me our time on earth is too short for not to, to think like this. Uh, what, what is profitable? What can we do? And here's, here's another e example that we're, we're looking at. In question number 10, or, or verse number 10, thank you. Who is the factious man? A factious man, after first and second admonition, refused. I better know who a factious man is. Because there's a lot of relationship issues with that person. So who is he? What does factious mean? When you argue with me? Not necessarily. When I argue with you, am I factious? What? Okay, so I'm divisive because I lay down laws of God and people don't like it. Is that, that, that's happened throughout the years. Is that necessarily divisive? That's, during fellowship, that's exactly what people call when we've preached on Romans 14. You're dividing, you're divisive. You speak on that too much. And there was trying to get people to realize where, where people were heading. And so, and what the other side of this is that you are, a, you are, the problem in Romans 16 was that they were divisive when it says they're contradicting the things which they learned. And yet it was applied, it would be read that way, and then the preachers would apply it. Well, you just can't be divisive in churches. Well, that's true. But that doesn't answer the question that the foundation is not what someone considers as divisive. Because what happens here? A factious man has been warned twice. What has he been warned with? I don't like this. Or have we gotten the scriptures down and found out what the truth is? That's what's happened. And that's how you, you turn away from him because what has happened? You didn't condemn him. And the scriptures are just there to consider. He condemned himself, didn't he? He is self-condemned. You think about that. He's God-condemned. Yeah, he is. That happened with the word of God. That showed the distinction with what he wanted and what the man was advocating. He self-condemned. That's when you leave him alone. When one's trying to study, one's trying to ask a question about what this is and what that is, when they're trying to deal with that, you ought to be forbearing and long-suffering. But there comes a time when that is going to be the issue that he's going to follow his people around. That's, see, that's what a factious man is. He encircles himself with people of like-minded that's not based upon the Word of God. It, it's, it, I think a great illustration is the medicine man that came in the, in the days of cowboy shows. And they had their potion, and they, they would be advocating this. You've got to have this, and you've got to have that. And promoting themselves as this great doctor of, of healer. That's a factious man. And a lot of the stuff was, was phony stuff. And here it is error. And yes, someone who wants to disrupt unity that's based upon the truth of God and disrupt a church, just because they, 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 they can be divisive in how they go about getting their crew together and dividing churches. And we, we, we've got to understand that. And, but it's, this is point... The problem is it's based upon the Word of God. And they've contradicted it, and they're self-condemned. How do you stand before God in judgment? When you knew the truth, because brethren, first admonition, second admonition, and you refused it. And you stand before God, so I didn't know. That was with somebody's opinion. No, it's taught the Word of God. That's what they went to. And that's the thing with any fellowship issue. We don't withdraw from people because uh, we, we have our opinion about things. It is centered for the Word of God. And that's what you and I, with unity, have to, have, to, have to work on those things. Get them out there. But what happens sometimes is the factiousness goes there. And t Titus is to, be ready, is to be ready for that. All right, question number, number six. How should a factious man be treated? 
Well, respected person, but ad, thank you. Admonition, warning. There's two of those warnings. And we come that, but after that, refuse. We see in verse 9, avoid. All right. That's how he's should be treated. Number six, number, question number seven. Why would Zenos and Apollos be useful to Titus in the cause of Christ on the island of Crete? They were there. How would they, how could they be useful with, with uh, if Zenos was a lawyer of the of Old Testament scriptures, and it was with the fact that it had its place, but there are not going to be foolish genealogies and so forth from that. Uh, he could be there and help the, the Jews. Apollos was was great orator, uh, the things that he could speak. But he could be one speaking uh, to the Gentiles, the Gentile people, and so forth. So a lot of that, they were useful, and they were to be supported as they go about their, their work. Number eight, question number eight. He said, what were the opportunities for Christians to be fruitful in Christian service? Well, they're go they'll be not unfruitful in verse 14. They would be leading out in those things. Question number nine. We read, in what sphere is the Christian love for one ever to abound? In what realm is that? It's in faith. Question number 15. Verse 15, all that, all that are with me salute thee. These may be people from Crete that are, that are, that are with Paul. And he says, salute them that love us in faith. Our love is rooted in our, our common faith that we share with one another. And it is rich and it's beautiful. It is instructive. It is helpful. It helps us get to heaven. It helps us to be right with God. And so it, the last one. Number, uh, number 11, question number 11, yeah, number 10. Why, why does Paul, there ought to be an L there, open his letter desiring God's grace to come to Titus, but now can end his letter by saying, grace be with you all. We'll talk about this in other epistles. It's just an observation. It's not necessarily what, 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 what intention of Paul was, but it's interesting that in his letters, he opens them up that says, I wish, I desire God's grace I got for you coming from God come from Jesus God's grace to come to you and then when he finishes grace be with you and if if there was an epistle that you can make this point with is Titus because the grace of God hath appeared bringing salvation to all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust we shall live soberly righteously in God what is that that's teaching that's called what God's grace. I've given you God's grace in three chapters. Let it be with you. Apply it. Let it be a part of your character. Grace is with you in its teaching. I wish it for you at the beginning of my letter. And every one of them. You'll read that at the end. I think it's instructive to realize he does that consistently. That idea with because it's already here. What is it? It's the teaching he just gave us. And reminding brethren of those things, what, what would be helpful, and reminding them the basis of, of their hope. Any, any questions or comments you'd like to add to that? David? And to be fair, we said contend for the faith. That doesn't mean be contentious, does it? Contend. Here's, here's, the, here's the facts. And we, won't, we always want to make sure we keep it that way. And, we, and, uh, and, that's, and that's, the way we, that's the way we keep unified, but we keep strong in the faith as well. All right. That will close out our study of, of Titus. And we will, after the gospel meeting, We'll begin, you can start reading the book of Hebrews. We'll begin with our study of, of Hebrews uh, following, Lord willing, following the, uh, the gospel meeting this coming, coming week. Thank you.